morning about how we are called to be master builders. And if you don't know, the Lego movie came out in 2014, so I'm not just playing nerds. But I'm long enough you should just, I'm not worried about spoiler alerts. And um, the Emmet is, well, the many figures in the movie are searching for the special. The, the one sort of like their salvation figure that will save their world from being frozen in the, by the Kraggle. And, which is short for crazy glue. And um, they're searching for who this special would be. And apparently Emmett is it. He's expected to be the most talented, most interesting, most extraordinary person in the universe who is capable of amazing things because he is the special. And to this point in the movie, he's never built anything except maybe a double-decker couch. By the way, if they sold those at Ikea, would you buy it? My son would. <laughs> no? Wow, we've got a bunch of wild sows and Vitruviuses in this room. Okay. Or like what Brisbane says later in the movie, like, what, what do you do with that? Like, if you're sitting on the top and in the middle, how do you get off to this side without climbing over somebody? And if you're in the bottom, then you've got to see through people's legs. Like, it's the silliest idea ever, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Emmett, we don't see the signs of a master builder. And as Vitruvius and Wildsail are walking through his mind, I don't know how that happens, but in the little world, it apparently is true. Um, there is, they don't see anything, and then they recognize, wait, the fact that there's this, there's this blank slate upon which creativity can, can explode, that is the sign that he is a special. He has to learn how to embrace the gift that he's been given. And, <clears throat> and while in the Lego movie, master builders have spent years trying to empty their minds, and Emmett's mind is already so prodigiously empty that there's nothing there to clear away in the first place. Right? That would, that would make cleaning so much easier if our houses were just prodigiously empty. But then, then it'd be really uncomfortable to, to sleep at night. Anyway, sidetracking. Um, and when I was working on this message for this week and thinking about how God has called us to be master builders, I realized it's, he doesn't call us to be prodigiously empty like Emmett. Instead, he calls us to be prodigiously filled with his spirit. God fills us with his spirit so that we can become, and in fact are called to be, his master builders in the world. You are filled to build, if, if you want to think of it that way. If, if you want to take this, this message and can reduce it down to three words, you are filled to build. Can everybody say that? You are filled to build. Filled to build. And I want to explore this from Exodus 31, verses 1 through 6, as we read about Bezalel and Oholiab. And if you have ever thought to name your children Bezalel and Oholiab, the Lord bless you, because those are a mouthful. But I want to see how God fills Bezalel and Oholiab to build his dwelling place. And what we can learn from that is we are called to be builders of his dwelling place as well. And so here we go, Exodus 31, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting in and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Ahizamach, <laughs> those Hebrew names, of the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. Father God, I pray that you would help us to see that you, the spirit that you gave to uh, Bezalel and Aholiab is the spirit that you give to us, that we would build all that you have commanded us. And Lord, may we walk in the confidence knowing that your promises are true, and at Pentecost you poured out your spirit that we would be filled, prodigiously filled, and empowered to do all that you have called us to do in building your kingdom. Let it be done, Lord. Let your will be done and your kingdom come on earth today as it is in heaven. 
Amen. Now, before we dive into Bethel and Aholiah, uh, and you guys are going to notice the trend, I like to jump back a little bit, build some context, and then jump forward to see where it goes. And so we're going to jump back, all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, where to help us understand Bethel and Aholiah's task and what it really was. And so first, we want to see how the Spirit is a sanctuary builder. The Spirit built the very first church. Did you guys know that? The place where God is worshipped, where God dwells among his people, where the people of God can gather in God's presence and then take God's presence into the world, is the creation. In Genesis 1, 1 and 2, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, God's first and foremost master builder, was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, pause. If I sound like I'm repeating what I said last week, you're right. And here's why. In this image, um, you'll see uh, it looks like a really, really awesome rainbow. And this image, I did find it. Um, all of, there are over 66,000 arcs in that image. Wow. And on the bottom, if you see the row, you'll see how it kind of alternates between uh, like white and gray, or light, depending on how the light shines, it's like light gray and dark gray. But those are all of the books of the Bible on alternating um, white and gray. And then the individual bars that stretch down, it's a little hard to see the way that the, the lighting is on the screen, but those are the individual chapters of each individual book. And those bars, the length represents the number of verses in each chapter. And so if you kind of get to the middle, it's a little hard to see on this one, but there's a really long one, and that's Psalm 119. And then the way that the person who developed this chart did it was um, the length of the reference from one part of the Bible back to another part of the Bible is color-coded based on how far away the two references are. And so you'll notice that in um, a little over 33,000 Bible verses, there is over 66,000 connections from one part of the Bible to another. So if you do the math, on average, a Bible verse is referencing two other Bible verses at the same time. So when Bible Project says their, their mission statement, their vision statement, we believe that the Bible is a unified story that points to Jesus, this is what they have in mind. The, the scriptures are unified, even though it's 66 books written by about 40 different authors over the span of 1,500 years, it tells one story, and it is all interconnected. And it all points to Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so, I mention this because what we see in Genesis chapter 1, we're going to see again in Exodus 30, 31. So let's explore that briefly. In Genesis chapter 1, God does what? God creates the heavens and the earth. And how does God create? He speaks. And how many times does God speak? Lots. Now there's a specific number, and it's really important to the story. Seven. Seven. There are seven creative um, speech acts of God. God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God said, let the dry land appear. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. And God said, let the waters swarm in with living creatures and let birds fly. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures. Seven acts of God speaking, bringing creation to its completion. Seven in scripture is the number of completion or fullness. It is the sign or the, when you see references to seven, um, you should be thinking, oh, this is God bringing his work to its fullness, or to its end, to its teleos. Um, that's why Sabbath occurs on the seventh day, because now the creation has completed, God is able to rest in the fullness of his creation, which means in relationship with his creation, with humanity. God is always intended to be in divine relationship with man and woman at the, at the apex of his creation. Not only this, but we, have, we see three times where God states, uh, 
has statements about the creation of man, and three is also a very important number in Scripture. Uh, and we see in Genesis 1, 26 and 28, God said, let us make man, humanity, in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, that's mission, and subdue it, that's kingship, that's royalty, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so not only has God created this incredible place to be in relationship with his creation, but he has appointed a royal priesthood where he has appointed kings and queens to govern it in partnership with him. So God is delegating his authority as creator to his created beings, the ones who bear his image. You remember last week where God breathed the breath of life into his image bearers, and we drew a parallel between that with Isaiah chapter 6, where God touches, where the angel touches Isaiah's lips with the coal, and how that was a parody of the idol um, cultic practices of sort of the ceremonies where the spirit of the god, whatever the idol would represent, was expected to um, go into the idol, and the idol then carry the presence of God. And we said, okay, humans carry the presence of God, and therefore how we act as the image bearers of God is hugely significant. And here we see that part of our image bearing is to rule on behalf of God. It's the same thing as if... if President Biden cannot be everywhere at the same time, right? Right. Okay. But he will send delegates with his seal of authority to go and to enact the, the, the things that he has declared. So he may send a delegate over to another country and they will work out a diplomacy, a diplomacy or a treaty. And it carries the same weight as though President Biden were there himself. Because the... The person going, the delegate, carries the same authority that he does, and that's how God works. And so we, as his image bearers, are given power and authority over the creation. We learned about that when we read uh, Ephesians a couple of months ago. And in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. And we discussed how last week this was God infilling humanity with the spirit of life. The Holy Spirit that allows us to function as God's image bearers. And when humanity turns from God in sin, we lose access to life. And I'm willing to, to go so far as saying we actually lose direct access to his spirit as a result. Now as we go forward, this is where I want to focus a little bit more on in Genesis 2 verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him, or planted him, in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And for a long time, I've always heard this in kind of the context of gardening or landscaping. All right, so uh, we, we need to go and we need to put wood chips down, so God had a really beautiful garden. But this verse means so much more than that. To work it and keep it describes the ideal vocation of humanity. Gordon Wenham writes this, The word to work is commonly used in the religious sense of serving God, and in priestly texts, especially of the tabernacle duties of the Levites. Similarly, to keep is commonly used in legal texts for observing religious commands and duties, in particularly of the Levitical responsibility for guarding the tabernacle from intruders. Expounding on this further, John Walton writes, The tasks given to Adam are of a priestly nature. Caring for sacred space. In ancient thinking, caring for sacred space was a way of upholding creation. By preserving order, non-order was held at bay. It was out of chaos that God brings order in creation and then he appoints his human representatives to maintain 
that order. If the priestly vocabulary in Genesis 2.15 indicates the same kind of thinking, the point of caring for sacred space should be seen as much more than landscaping or even priestly duties. Right. Maintaining order made one a participant with God in the ongoing task of sustaining the equilibrium God had established in the cosmos. In other words, we continue the creative act of God. In Egyptian thinking, attached this not only to the role of priests as they maintain the sacred space in the temples, but also to the king, whose task was to complete what was unfinished and to preserve the existent, not as a status quo, but in a continuing, dynamic, even revolutionary process of remodeling and improvement. This combines the subduing and ruling of Genesis 1 with the working and keeping of Genesis 2. And if we take what those scholars are observing in Scripture, and we think about it, what that means is God in His creation has ordained humanity to partner with Him in the sustaining of, cre of creation. So you can, to borrow kind of a biblical image, you can think of it this way. Moses, he's holding his hands out over the Amalekites, and every time his hands drop, the Israelites start to lose the battle. This is in like um, Exodus 16, 17. But when um, his arms are held up by Joshua and Aaron, then the Israelites win the battle. And it's almost like God is saying, I'm, I'm asking humanity to partner with me to, to help hold up the creation. As my image bearers, you have a divine responsibility to function in the way that I have created, because that is how my creation stays together. When humanity turns from God, the creation begins to disintegrate back into chaos. And that's what is symbolized by the flood of Noah. Um, when we get to Exodus, uh, the first ten chapters of Exodus with the uh, plagues that are, um, are hitting Egypt, they are works of decreation, uncreation. You have the, the waters are turning back into blood, life which is becoming dead. You have um, chaos which is coming about. You have uh, light, which is fleeing, and darkness settling over the land to the point in which all the firstborn die. It is an uncreation, and then we're getting to the place in Exodus where God is now um, acting in new creation. He is making a new work. And then, last, as we think about the Spirit as the creative Spirit, or the Spirit as the one who builds a sanctuary, uh, we see that creation is tiered according to the proximity it has to God's direct presence. So right in the center, you have the tree of the in the center of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then outside of that, you have the garden proper, Eden. And then outside of that is the land of Eden. And outside of the land of Eden is the dry land. And so as uh, Dr. Brian Lidbeck writes, Genesis reveals that the author casts the spirit in the role of sanctuary builder. He depicts the Garden of Eden as a sanctuary where humanity is blessed and God is worshipped. Adam is an archetypal priest king of the Garden Commission to enlarge its boundaries, and sin is the spoiler of the good creation. Thus, as we move into the book of Exodus, Moses presents the Spirit as the agent involved in constructing the first sanctuary and expanding it over all the earth. This function of the Spirit becomes even more evident during the construction of the tabernacle under Moses. So we follow the logic of this imagery, the Spirit of God, in the act of creation, is creating a place for God to dwell among and be worshipped by His creation. And then we can attest that the Holy Spirit is in fact the first temple builder. Does that make sense? Okay? The first master builder, if you will, was the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, just after his wonderful cosmic temple is constructed and open to all creation, humans disobey, we take hands of spray paint, we go all over the garden with graffiti, and we destroy the beautiful creation that God has made. We fail to keep and to guard the new temple. We fail in our priestly duties. Adam was a bad pastor. And the world is sent again into a state of wild and waste, and the humans are cast out of the garden where they have to work the land. But thankfully, God didn't leave humanity in the wilderness. 
From, for from the beginning, he's been on a mission to restore his dwelling place among humanity. We talked about that a few weeks ago as we traced the seed of God's promise. And in Exodus, we see a number of parallels to the creation story, especially as we dive into the design and construction of the tabernacle. And so here, we're going to see a parallel to the Spirit's sanctuary building as we look at humans as God's sanctuary builders. And so just a, big, a brief uh, history montage for you. Um, if you Throughout the book of Genesis, we see a number of mini temples or mini sanctuaries or mini places of worship that are built throughout the narrative. Uh, Noah builds an altar after the flood on a high mountain. Abraham builds altars in various locations, often in the high mountains right next to trees. And the purpose of the trees and mountains are to show or to reflect back on Genesis 1, where the land comes up out of the water like a mountain does. Think Hawaii. Isn't Hawaii great? I've never been there, but if any of you want to send my family, we will go. Um, anyway, get distracted. And the trees are meant to resemble the tree of life. They are, so all of these altars throughout the book of Genesis are intended to make you think back to Eden. And so the, the narrative pathway in Genesis is how do we get back to Eden? How do we get back to a place in which humanity and God can dwell together in peace and harmony, and that humanity can be restored to its royal priestly role as God's representatives? Jacob builds altars as he encounters God, and these altars, his altars, again, high places with trees. Israel goes to Egypt to be saved from a famine. Thanks, Joseph, where they eventually are enslaved. Thanks, Joseph. For 400 years. God raises up a deliverer, Moses, to free the people from Egyptian slavery, and the plagues of Egypt are depicted as decreation, like we talked about just a few seconds ago. The undoing of creation and the plummeting of Egypt into a wild and wilderness waste. The purpose of bringing Israel out of this is stated in Exodus 19.6, that God would establish Israel as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Right here you have royalty and you have priesthood combined into the same idea. And now it's not just to, and now it's to a representative of God, God's nation, God's people, who are going to reflect his image, or should reflect his image to the world around them. And the people are super excited. They raise their hands, just like kids in first grade, saying, send me up, I want to do it, I want to do it. And they don't even know what the question is. And God's like, okay, sweet, here are some things you got to do. One, Worship me only. Two, don't make an image. Please, 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 don't make any images. Three, honor the Sabbath. Four, don't use my name in vain. I got three and four mixed up. Forgive me. And then he goes on the rest of the Ten Commandments. And we get to the point where the people are like, yes, yes, we're on board. We want to do it. And so in Exodus 24, 15 through 16, then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The cloud is representative of God's presence. So again, this should have... Um, Genesis chapter 1 um, images. The glory of God dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Do you notice the six plus one pattern? God's spirit is hovering. He's doing something. And then on the seventh day, he called Moses into his presence. We'll see that pattern again. And so in the building of a new creation, we see God's Spirit hovering. The cloud was over the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered for six days. The appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. All of the Spirit imagery hovering over the place where God is going to do a new work, a new creation. There are also seven divine speech acts in Exodus 25-31. The Lord spoke to Moses and gives him directions for offerings of the Ark of the Covenant, the table of the sacred bread, and the other furniture in the tabernacle. The Lord speaks to Moses and gives him directions for the atonement offering as he takes a census for Israel. The Lord speaks to Moses and gives directions for the bronze bowl for washing. The Lord speaks to Moses again and gives directions for the oil of ritual anointing. The Lord speaks a fifth time and tells Moses directions for sacred incense. And on the sixth speech act of God. 
Now, pause for a second, think back to Genesis 1. What was the sixth thing that God spoke? Let living creatures come onto the land. And what was the pinnacle of the living creatures? You and me. And so on the sixth, sixth speech act of the Lord in Exodus 25 to 31, the Lord spoke to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Al, son of Hur, spell check, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence and with knowledge and all craftsmanship. So on the sixth speech act of God, we see a commissioning of human beings to function as the, as the creative agents for God's dwelling place. Not only that, when you look at the meanings of their names, Bezalel's name means in the shadow of El. So if you're in the shadow of something, and you look up, what do you see? The thing. So if you're in the shadow of a tree, and you look up, you see a if you're in the shadow of an awning, you look up and you see A. If you're in the shadow of God, you look up and you see. So who's hovering over Bezalel? God. So Bezalel's name means one over whom God hovers. Bezalel is filled with the Spirit to perform a creative act on God's behalf. Not only that, his dad's name, Uri, comes from Uriel, which means God is my light. What was the first thing God created? And then Aholia means Father is my tent. So Aholia lives in the dwelling place because they're building a tent for God the Father. So we have even in their names an expression of their purpose, which is to bring about a new creation in, inspired and empowered by the Spirit so that God can dwell with humanity. God's building the house and he's called us to do it. We're, we're filled to build and we are created to be master builders. And then check out the seventh speech act in Exodus 31, 12. The Lord speaks to Moses and calls them to Sabbath. Well, what did God do on the last day of creation? On day seven. He Sabbath. He rested from all his work. And so the parallels between Exodus and Genesis are astounding. Both narratives start with the presence of God, God's spirit, hovering over even Bethel and Napoleon's name allude to God's spirit hovering over them. Both Genesis and Exodus record seven speech acts of God. Um, and, by the way, after the tabernacle was built, there are seven more declarations that it was done as the Lord had commanded Moses. When you read um, Exodus 35 through 40. In both, they emphasize that humans were commissioned on the sixth day of creation. Both show a divine infilling, the breath of life in Genesis 2-7, and the Spirit of God filling Bezalel and Aholiab in Exodus 31, both culminate in the Sabbath, a time where God is resting in the fullness of his creation in relationship with his people. Not only that, but the tabernacle and later the temple is going to resemble the creation. There are cherubim woven throughout the curtains. The cherubim were placed in Genesis 3.24 to guard the entrance to, to Eden. In other words, these spiritual beings are God's, essentially, um, doormen. And they're the ones who are making sure that nothing that should not go into God's holy place goes into God's holy place. And so they are protecting the holiness of God. And we see that in both Genesis 3 and in Exodus um, in the tabernacle and later the temple. The lampstand is designed to look like a tree, and it has light that should never go out. Light is the life of men. And so you have the, the tree of life in the holy place where God dwells, which is meant to resemble Eden. The altar out in the courtyard was related to the land. It looked like a mountain. It was this tall contraption, and it had steps going up, and it was you would you would it would look like a mountain. And next to it was a giant basin, which uh, in First Kings seven is even called the sea, which represents the water. So you have creation being identified or being um, imaged in the construction of God's dwelling place. 
The tabernacle and later the temple were always intended to be signs of God's rule and reign over all the cosmos and the calling of God's people to bring his presence into all the world. And so check out these parallels between uh, the Garden of Eden and the tabernacle and tem temple layout. They, their layouts mirror each other. In the middle, we have the tree of life corresponding to the Holy of Holies. Then you have the garden corresponding to the holy place. Then you have the land of Eden, which corresponds to the courtyard, and then you have the outer lands, which is where God's glory is intended to go, so that his temple would fill the entire earth. And lastly, I want to mention that the tabernacle is erected in the beginning. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created. Exodus 40, verse 2, on the first day of the first month of the year, you shall erect the tabernacle. And so it's a new beginning. This is a new creation. Whereas William Johnstone writes, The tabernacle which Moses constructs in accordance with the heavenly blueprint that Yahweh reveals to Moses in seven speeches is the physical model of the universe. As the creation narrative reaches its climax in Sabbath, so the specification of the tabernacle. The instrument for recreation reaches its climax in a command for Sabbath rest. God marks the perfection of creation by rest on the seventh day, and Yahweh summons Israel to observe Sabbath as a weekly sharing in the day that marks the completion of creation in harmony and perfection. That's why we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday, because Jesus has brought to fulfillment the Sabbath of God's rest. And so Jesus has noticed that resurrection is on the first day of the new week. It is the eighth day. And so we experience the fullness of God's Sabbath, where we are called to do that, because we believe in him as his image bearers. And so as we go back to Bezalel and Aholiab, we see God's Spirit filling them, and very likely the rest of the workers that are working with them, in order to build a dwelling place for God. The tabernacle was meant to symbolize the cosmos, the created world, serving as a continual reminder to the people of their divine call to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, fulfilling the divine mandate for all humanity, to have dominion and rule over the creation, and to work and to keep God's sacred space, expanding the glory of God to the ends of the earth. God filled the humans with the Holy Spirit to empower them, to build a place for him to dwell with his people, and for people to dwell with him and experience his rest, his Sabbath. Like Bezalel and Aholiab and their helpers, the followers of Jesus are called to be filled with the Spirit of God and to partner with him in building his new temple and expanding his kingdom to the ends of the earth. In other words, you are a master builder, and you are filled to build God's temple in the world as we know it. And so if we fast forward now to the New Testament, we see at the end of Luke and the beginning of Acts where uh, Jesus promises the promise of the Father that would come upon them. And I think that word upon, or um, as Luke says in 24, 49, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high, it's this image of being covered, of having God's Spirit rest on you or cover over you. And in Acts 1, 4, and 5, and 8, we see Jesus saying, And while staying with them, Jesus ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized, immersed with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now if you take the commission in Acts chapter 8, we will be as witnesses in Jerusalem, where that's where the temple was, in Judea and Samaria, where that's where the followers of God were, and to the ends of the earth. And if you, and it just occurred to me as I'm speaking, you could map that onto the tree of life, the garden, the land of Eden, the outer lands, the holy of holies, the holy place, the courtyard, the outer lands. Jerusalem, where God's presence first dwell in the, in the temple, but now the temple is being expanded through the people of God, so that God's presence is going into all the city. 
God's presence is going into all the land. God's presence is going into the all the places. So we see, even in the book of Acts, that God's master plan was for his presence to fill the entire cosmos. And in Acts chapter 2, 2 and 4, where we see the giving of the Spirit on Pentecost, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Remember the wind imagery from uh, God's breath breathing in, or the word ruach, which is the word commonly used for Holy Spirit, but it also means wind or breath. This rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided in tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on, hovered over each one of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So, in other words, the 120 in the upper room were all of a sudden given the same spirit as Bezalel and Aholiab. To do what? To go and expand God's kingdom. To be his master builders. <clears throat> and as we continue with this theme in the New Testament, we'll see that not only is Christ the cornerstone, Peter mentions this in Acts chapter 4, um, Paul mentions it in Ephesians chapter 2, but that we are building his temple <coughs> on that cornerstone. But we're not using physical bricks. As Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, and then verse 9, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You are filled with the Spirit of God. Jesus, Jesus promised that all who believe in me, I will pour out my Spirit upon them. Paul, or Peter wrote in, uh, he didn't write it, Luke wrote what Peter said, at the end of his sermon on Pentecost, that um, all who repent and declare Jesus as Lord will be filled or will be given the Holy Spirit. We are, as Jesus' followers, called to receive God's Spirit and to be his master builders. You are called to be prodigiously filled, not prodigiously empty. You are called to be the special. Because the world that is away from God doesn't does not know God, does not know His Spirit, and so they cannot participate in His building. Instead, we are filled with God's Spirit to go and reach them, to share our Spirit with them, so that they may be filled with God's Spirit, and they too may be master builders with us. We are God's master builders. Now, I want to pause for a second, and I want to ask the question, if we're called, all of us, everybody in this room, and all of the followers of Jesus are called to be master builders with God, does that mean that everybody has to be a pastor? No. Does everybody have to be a vocational missionary? No. Does everybody have to be an evangelist? No. Where you, your number one job is to go to proclaim? Yeah. What did does the world and the holy have to? Exodus 31 3. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, to work in every craft. Every craft. It's physical labor. God has sanctified work. So as you're in as you're in the, do the coffee shop, the donut shop, or, or the greenhouses, you are filled with the presence of God to establish God's kingdom there, where people can dwell in God's presence because you are there. If you're selling paint in the stores, you are filled with the Spirit of God so that you carry the presence of God with you and you establish His kingdom in the stores that you visit. If you are working in the schools or in other churches, you carry the Spirit of God so that you can build His kingdom where you are at. You are his master builder. 
I love hearing the stories of, how, of you know, what you guys do for work and how, you know, I know some of you, uh, Joanne, you shared the story of how God called you to prison. And um, you taught inmates for years. God anointed you, God filled you with his spirit so that you could bring his presence into, what do they call it? Jail. Into jail, into high security prisons. Gates cannot keep God's spirit out because his people go in. God, has, if you are a homemaker, God has filled you with his Holy Spirit so that you can bring the presence of God into your home and thereby your children and your family members can dwell with God. If you're, Cindy, you do gigs. Okay? When um, there's a, a guy at Wyandotte family who drove for Uber or Lyft, one of those two, and he just had a huge heart to share, to share Jesus with people. And he realized, I have a 20 to 30 minute captive audience in my back seat. Now, he wasn't weird about it. He didn't uh, just say, hey, do you know where you're going when you die? He just said, hey, tell me, where are you headed? Oh, what, why are you headed there? He just struck up natural conversation, but he listened with the ears of God's spirit. And he said, people will tell you all kinds of things when they're in the back seat of your car. Oh, yeah, I got to go to court because of this custody battle with my wife, and she's you know, doing this and this and this, but then I'm doing this and this and this, and we just, we, we don't want the kids to get messed up, or whatever. And he's sitting there going, God, this is a divine moment. Will you speak in this moment so that, so that you may be revealed to the person in this back seat, that they would know that there is a God in heaven who sees where they're at, who knows what they're going through, and can give them the way through. Whether that's a reconciliation of a relationship, whether that's favor with the courts, whether that's freedom from addiction, whatever it may be. And you say, hey, you know, I only got a couple of minutes, but can I tell you the person who saved me? Or can I share a little bit of, of what happened in my life? And he starts telling them the work of Jesus in his life. He proclaims the divine works of God. There, there, you can do this in the grocery aisle. You can do this on the farm. You can do this wherever God has placed you because he has filled you with his spirit and has called you to be a master builder. Let the place that you occupy be the place where God dwells. Please, 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 don't keep God here. As, as Solomon writes in the dedication of the temple, as Stephen quoted in his death message, God cannot dwell in a house made with hands. Therefore, he has called us and filled us to go and to build his house but by his spirit. Go and be his master builders. Go and seek the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Spirit daily. If you have not experienced that, seek the Spirit daily. We are, that's why we're going through this, this series um, in preparation for Pentecost, because I want us to be filled with the Spirit so that we are going out and doing the works of the Spirit, building the kingdom of God, so that every place where our feet tread would be blessed with the blessing of Abraham, and that it would be one for God, that his blessing would go into all the world, and all the families of the world would be blessed through him. That was fulfilled in Jesus, and now we proclaim that fulfillment. You are called. Everyone say amen. Amen. Which means truly, truly. truly I agree. Yep. You are right. Yep. Yep. You are you are called to be filled. Everybody say amen. Amen. And you are called to build. Amen. amen. You can do it. Thus well in the holy we're empowered to participate in the forming of God's new creation. A people for himself, Israel. We are empowered to participate in the forming of God's new creation. A people for himself, a people of every nation, of every tribe, and of every tongue. And as we go, we fulfill the calling that God has placed on our life. This is what will come about. Revelation 11, 15. Let me find it in a second. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who was or 
who is and who was. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. We are preparing for the giving of God's temple, for the receiving of the new heavens and the new earth, where God will dwell with man. Or in Revelation 21, 3 through 7, John continues in your eyes, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Do you hear echoes from Exodus 19? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water, of the water of life, without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That's Revelation 21, 3 through 7. That's what we're building toward. Christ will bring the building of his kingdom, the building of his cosmic temple to its fulfillment. But we are called to participate with him in doing so. We are living stones called to go out and to, and to proclaim the name of Jesus, that the stones that are around will be filled with the Spirit as well, that they too will become living stones, and God's temple will build into them. That is our calling, that is our vocation, and there is no higher thing we can do. And we can do it when we're teaching classes. We can do it when we're planting flowers. We can do it when we're brewing coffee. We can do it when we're raising children and grandchildren. We can do it when we're knitting and when we're sewing. We can do it when we're working a cash register. We can do it because God's Spirit fills us and He has blessed and honored our work. You are filled with the Spirit of God. You are given all wisdom and intelligence and craftsmanship to perform the calling that God has given you. And so go, be filled with the Spirit, build God's kingdom. You are filled to build. Go and be His master. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He fill you with His Spirit. May you know that you are called in all that you do, no matter what age, no matter what vocation, no matter where He has placed you. Do not think that you have nothing that you can give, because He has given you everything you need. I know that uh, sometimes you know, just with the demographics of our church, there are a lot of us who are retired or, or anticipating retirement, and the question is, what do I do then? And it's not uncommon for someone to retire who's taken their whole identity from their work life, and then just a few months later, their, their lives have expired because they've lost a sense of purpose. Now I want you to know that even in retirement, God has called you, He has filled you, and He will use you. I had a friend of mine the other week share the story where his wife's mother, so she's in her 80s, and he's sitting in church, and she's asking the question, what can I do? God, I've, you know, 80 years, it's been great, but all these young people are running faster than I can run, and they're talking faster than I can talk, and they're listening, and they're, they're typing faster than I can type, I don't even know what typing is. What can I do? And she hears the call. There are young men and there are young women who don't know how to grow mature and dress. There are young moms who did not see what a godly mother looked like. There are young dads who do not know what a godly father looks like. There are people starting in their careers who don't know what it means to serve God in the workplace. And we need spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers to partner with them to link arms with them and say, I will show you the way, because I've walked here in the path before you. 
like I said, it doesn't matter young or old, it doesn't matter rich or poor, it doesn't matter whether it's white collar work or blue collar work, or green collar work, you can fulfill God's call, you can be his master builder. You are filled. And with that, be blessed as you go in the name of the Lord. He is with you, he keeps you, he fills you. He gives you great favor. He is gracious and generous to you. There is nothing that he will not give you as you seek him and you follow in his way. And as you do so, you will experience his Sabbath, his peace, his rest, and you will invite others to do the same.